My name is Joe Foy and I'm Protected Areas Campaigner for the Wilderness Committee. Every year about this time we put out our annual report. In it you'll see some of our campaign activities that goes from about May 2020 until April 2021. I also produce a video meant for our supporters, our donors, and all the people that have helped work on the Wilderness Committee's campaigns this past year to protect the fabulous wilderness and wildlife, endangered wilderness and wildlife that we seek to protect from industrial activities from being cut down or, or wrecked and ruined. Now we have offices in Vancouver, in Victoria, in Winnipeg and Toronto, and it's from those offices that our campaigners, volunteers, and our support staff work with local groups and organizations, local environmental groups as allies, neighborhood groups, indigenous communities are often our allies, as we seek protection for these fabulous wilderness areas. Now, you've seen on TV some of the reports of the epic battles going on right across Canada to fight climate-changing projects like pipelines, stop the tar sands, which is contributing to climate change right around the world. Here in British Columbia, we've experienced some of our worst climate disasters. We've ever seen huge forest fires. As I talk to you right now, it's just pounding with rain that has flooded whole communities. Working on environmental issues is certainly front page stuff. It makes up your evening television news, but it's also incredibly empowering and downright fun to work with communities, with individuals, with people pushing back to protect wilderness and wildlife. After all, Canada still has some of the most amazing ancient landscapes and absolutely mind-blowing wildlife. That's why I made this video. That's why I make it every year. Sit back and relax. I hope you enjoy the show today. We started off May, like you, dealing with the global pandemic, which for us meant more working at home, more meeting online, and more time in wild nature. And then a wonderful win when the Supreme Court of Canada refused to hear an appeal of the federal government's rejection of Tosico Mine Company's proposed new prosperity mine, effectively killing the ill-conceived mine project for good. What a tremendous victory for the Chilcotin Nation to protect their Teltan B Fish Lake and for their allies, like the Wilderness Committee, who had been working on this for many years. Then hot off the press, 20,000 copies of our education report, BC's Vanishing Wildlife, sent to supporters about how we can push for provincial species at risk legislation and why we need to, all the ways our species are suffering here in the province of BC. We started a Facebook Live weekly program called Coffee Talk Live featuring our campaigners. Today we are going to be talking about old growth forests and why this spring and summer are one of the most, is going to be one of the most important times ever for old growth forests in BC. In the late 90s, the BC portion of the Skagit River was turned into a provincial park right next to Manning Park. When the two parks came together, we had a beautiful protected area, but there's a kind of an area right in the middle that we call the donut hole. Hello, darlings. <laughs> what? They told me to have fun with it. Allow me to introduce you to Ms. Wanda Fuca Strait. Now, I know this series is called Coffee Talk, but today I'm going to be sipping and spilling tea about the federal government's purchase of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Ah yes, that $17 billion metal straw Justin Trudeau bought for us without asking. I'm also going to start this off with a fun little poll that I put together. Hopefully it works actually. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Starting off with a poll. Have you ever heard of Southern Mountain Caribou? Yes, 
Or no, there should be a poll that pops up. Hopefully I'm not lagging too much. I'll, I'll just wait a little bit for comments to come in. All right, I think it's lagging a little bit, but we got some answers. There we go, sweet. 100% of people have heard of Southern Mountain Caribou before. That's awesome. As soon as the snow had melted out of the mountains, we headed up to BC's Fraser Canyon country to the Spuzzum Valley to see if logging was continuing in endangered species habitat. So here I am on the Spuzzum Creek logging road. Wanted to check out to see if there were still logging spotted owl habitat up here and it looks like they're not actively logging now because a big debris torrent is coming down. It's like a landslide in a creek. Fishing season is set to start. But new admin fees for licenses and park permits are irking the Wilderness Committee. They're calling it a transaction fee, but the reality is that they're just upping the price on this. There was already a transaction fee built into the prices that people were paying for this, and this is um, a gouge. The new system charges $4.50 more. That means a fishing license will now cost $23.70, while a provincial park day pass will cost $9.50. That worries Eric Rader. The new provincial park permitting system and the fishing and hunting license systems is far more costly. They're creating a barrier to keep people out of nature and wilderness. I thought these are mosquitoes. These are little, oh man, these little flies, which I'm not familiar with, but they bite. Whoa, and there are so many. Okay, here's Stave Lake over here. We've come up to check out this area here. Look at this. So the life of a spotted owl habitat hunter has sometimes got aggravation. And we found the logging road that leads to the monastic peak remaining piece of spotted owl habitat that we came to see, the one that they slated for logging. But look at this. It's a forest service road, but it's locked. Okay, I'm back. Back at the Murdo Creek logging road, forest service road. This time I got the thing I need, which is my electric mountain bike. Time to head on up and have a look at this monastic peak, old growth forest. Beautiful. Whoa. You've got mail. I brought these pennies along with me today to talk a little bit about this species and it, its numbers. Before industrial logging started, about 1860, the biologists estimate that there were about 500 pairs of spotted owls in the ancient forests of southwestern BC. So that's about a thousand spotted owls and as it so happens, I have counted out a thousand pennies in this jar. By the early 1990s, when the Wilderness Committee began to sound the alarm about the plight of the spotted owl in Canada, we were down to a hundred spotted owls left in the ancient forests. In 2018, provincial government biologists could only find three spotted owls remaining in the ancient forests of British Columbia. We produced an online interactive map showing BC timber sales, which is wholly owned by the province of British Columbia and their destructive old growth logging practices. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Coffee Talk. Soy Wabili getting started. 
started this morning, but hope you got your coffee. Welcome to Coffee Talk, the program where we bring sexy back to environmental issues. And by sexy, I mean your burning hot attention, engagement, and motivation to take action. Because people power is what turns us on at the Wilderness Committee. All right, so today we're going to get down and dirty with some straight talk about cuts to environmental protections in Ontario. I'm your host today, Katie. Thank you. Thank you. I'm the Ontario campaigner with the Wilderness Committee. Most damaging of these changes is a built-in exception that allows industry and developers to pay into a vague conservation fund in exchange for destroying known endangered species habitat. It's kind of like a pyramid scheme that results in diminishing gains for those species at risk. You could also call it a pay-to-slay regulation. good buddy all right here we go the uh opportunity to have nature around us from the very early years has been something that manitobans have appreciated we haven't really had a vision of making sure that there's more nature when i was a kid when we wanted to go camping we would be able to go camping anywhere we wanted to fish with a canoe or a little boat behind us but we never had a problem with trying to book into campground reservations and wondering and wondering where we were going to have an opportunity to go to these places there was enough campgrounds there was enough nature around us that we could visit what we haven't had happen is a growth in provincial parks and campgrounds that has kept pace with the number of people that we have in Manitoba, our population is growing. It's the ability for people to go out and get to nature. It's just not as easy as it was when I was growing up. smell the oil in the air. You can see it just behind me where Trans Mountain has spilled 150,000 to 190,000 liters of crude into the local ecology. I just just talking to Chief Dalton Silver from the Sumas First Nation and they're very concerned because the hydrology here links into the aquifer where his community gets their, their drinking water and as well as surrounding communities. Hot off the press, 20,000 copies of our brand new education report about Ontario's conservation hotspots, those battleground areas where we're seeking to protect endangered species habitat, protected area proposals, and get better protection for Ontario's provincial parks. Wow, a tremendous win for the Wilderness Committee. Manitoba's Turtle Mountain Provincial Park finally protected from industrial destruction. Great news. Got a quick little video for the Wilderness Committee supporters. This is a thank you video. I want to show you what we've got with your support. I'm standing in Turtle Mountain Provincial Park. And this area was protected, permanently protected, under the Provincial Parks Act. Now, Wilderness Committee supporters been raising your voice you've been supporting us financially you've been showing up at rallies and events over the last few years and we're trying to protect our provincial parks that's one of our big mandates in manitoba keep supporting us keep paying attention to what we're talking about in the wilderness committee write some letters talk to your elected officials we're going to continue to succeed in manitoba and we're going to move the line so that we live more comfortably within nature within the confines of our climate and nature and wilderness I'm Eric, on the ground in Turtle Mountain Provincial Park with a bit of a success story a recap from the last couple of years.
Okay, Jeff, tell us a little bit about this Silver Daisy Trail we're going to head up. So it's an old it's an old trail. It's been in the 103 Hikes book in the past. There's a nice description here of it. We're going to be crossing the Samalo River and going up seven switchbacks. Side of a mountain. Seven switchbacks. <laughs> That's right. So on the way, we'll be going through a spotted owl wildlife habitat area. That's right. Yeah. So Where we start in Manning Park, cross the river here. Then we're in Skagit Valley Park. And then we go into a spotted owl WHA on the first part of the switchbacks, the so lower part of the trail. We'll check the that out then we're going to check oh. out the old mine sites that's right because we're entering the world famous donut hole area yeah. Look at that, baby. mine site at least some of the cabins after a hundred years of digging up this mountain pretty much all there is to show for it. Time to extinguish the mining claims. Never going to be a big mine here. A lot of history and a lot of beauty. Time to protect the place. Welcome to our first camp on 26 Mile Creek. Here deep in the valley. Tent right beside the creek. I think that's going to work out really well. Beautiful forest in here. had feared in the valley where the last remaining wild owls that we know of live, Buzzum Valley, here in the Fraser Canyon. And this is going on right now. Un freaking believable. I can see dug firs cut all over this mountainside. Old ones, big old ones, all through this block. I'll get the drone up. Most endangered bird species in Canada. So far as anyone knows, this is the last valley where spotted owls still exist in the wild. No action to rein in the timber industry. Let's get that drone out. Park near Lake Opiongo at the entrance to a logging road. Many of the visitors to Ontario's most popular park don't realize that the majority, 65% of the park, is not truly protected because it's open to commercial logging. Over 5,000 kilometers of logging roads like the one behind me crisscross and scar the supposed backcountry of Algonquin impacting ecosystems, water, and wildlife. That's more than the total distance of driving from Calgary to Halifax. A big, big win for endangered species in southern Ontario where the provincial government was looking to weaken regulations on gravel mines, but you rode in, the Wilderness Committee organized, and the government dropped their terrible proposal. We wildly celebrated our 40th birthday with our supporters, mostly online due to COVID-19.
fantastic news. Paul George, the founder of the Wilderness Committee, named to the Order of British Columbia. Paul co-founded the Wilderness Committee and for 20 years ran the organization producing endangered wilderness calendars, which the organization still does to this very day. stakes all over this place. I'm Peter McCartney, the climate campaigner at the Wilderness Committee, and as you can see, I'm standing right where Trans Mountain needs to put their pipeline, Falls Creek, to the Coquihalla Summit Recreation Area. To make way for their pipeline, they have to clear a swath, brand new swath, all the way from one side of the Coquihalla Summit to the other. They're time limited here, they were supposed to start this week. Okay, just getting ready to head off on another adventure. This time it's a trail building expedition with Wilderness Committee. There's going to be seven of us heading up to the fabulous Silver Daisy Trail in the Dornhole area. And our whole mission is to clear out some of the bush around the old Silver Daisy Trail. The BC government announces several logging deferrals, including in Clackwood Sound, but leaves most endangered old growth forest unprotected from logging. The forest that I'm standing in is part of the Argonaut Creek drainage and it's about an hour and a half north of Revelstoke. This forest is home to an endangered herd of southern mountain caribou, but it's one of the strongest herds in BC with 150 members. But the forest that I'm standing in and this old growth beautiful habitat is about to be auctioned off by the BC government's own logging agency called BC Timber Sales or BCTS. And we're here to stop that from happening. In Canada, caribou could be one of the first species that we lose forever. And how we deal with caribou today will set a precedent for how we deal with future species facing extinction. We need your help today. Tell the BC government to leave the Argonaut Creek drainage intact. Tell them to cancel the auction of these cut blocks and protect the habitat of the North Columbia caribou herd. You've got mail. What does it take to get protected status for rare and endangered old growth forests in Ontario? My name's Katie and I'm standing in the middle of the Kachakoma Forest, located on Michisagig territory in an area of Ontario known as the Kawarthas on Crown Land. This forest was recently surveyed by a team of ecologists and found to be perhaps the largest known old and older growth eastern hemlock forest in all of Canada. The Wilderness Committee, along with local citizens, have been pressuring the forest company and the government to put a moratorium on logging in Kachakoma Forest until full conservation value unlogged can be assessed. 
21,000 copies hot off the press of the Wilderness Committee's education report entitled No Conservation Without Justice. It's about how everywhere we work is on Indigenous unceded territories and those land rights need to be restored for any conservation work to sit on a firm foundation. Over my shoulder here is pretty much what the old growth logging industry is all about. This is a three or four or 500 year old Western red cedar, nice and straight, clear, no branches, quite a ways up. And this is what companies that are, that are after old growth are, are after. It's extremely valuable. And this kind of forest is extremely valuable from an ecological perspective, from a carbon perspective. And unfortunately, this tree and the forest behind me is slated for logging at some point. You can see uh, just over my shoulder here, this is a cut block boundary. I just hiked in off a brand new logging road just five minutes down the, the hill here and this kind of rich high productive highly productive forest is what there's so little left of and it's what the government hasn't taken enough action to protect the deferrals announced as part of their old growth strategic review announcement uh, response to that don't protect these kinds of forests they remain open to logging and we need to ramp up these cam this campaign to ensure that the last of these forests remain standing forever you've got mail It's going to be a wild and woolly day, so stick with me on this video as we work to fight to protect one of Canada's most endangered bird species. I'm talking about the Northern Spotted Owl, and it's right here in the Spuzzum Valley that the last known breeding pair of spotted owls still exists. That pair has produced chicks for two years. That's why I'm here in the Spuzzum Valley, but I'm also here because the BC government has approved logging of some of the last spotted owl habitat in the province, some beautiful old growth forests. That's why we're here to document that and to get it stopped. See the dump trucks full of toxic fracking sludge going in and out behind me. Locals told me of a place where there was a giant black pile of waste from fracking operations all over the boreal forest in northeastern British Columbia. So I had to go check it out. But nothing could have prepared me for what I saw. 50 meter high pile of black sludge hundreds of meters across. And most people in this province would never hear about it because they don't visit up here. But this entire landscape has been industrialized to the point of breaking. That's why we need to stop fracking in this province. No more permits. Stay tuned to the Wilderness Committee to find out how. The Wilderness Committee began warning about park privatization as the pandemic struck and Premier Brian Pallister and his progressive conservative cronies rolled out legislation for park privatization. At the time, they vehemently declared that this is only about online provincial park passes. We know that that's not true now. Two weeks ago, the Manitoba Liberals discovered a request for proposal. The government is trying to hire a consultant to, these are their words, monetize parks divest park services, and find private investment for provincial parks. That's privatization. It's in writing, there's no way to deny it. So this is what I want you to take home. Talk to your family, push our elected officials with this. Make this public and known. I'm Eric on a Riverside rant in Winnipeg for the Wilderness Committee. Near Victoria, we invited our supporters, masked up of course, to go for a walk and talk in old growth forests in a nearby regional park. Online, we invited our supporters to attend a webinar about the Nuchotlet Nation's efforts to regain control over their lands on the beautiful Nuka Island, west coast of Vancouver Island. Peatlands are the greatest storehouse of carbon on the planet. Making up only 3% of the world's surface, 
Peatlands store 30% of the Earth's carbon. Manitoba has extensive peatlands, and they are climate-stabilizing superpower. It takes hundreds of years for peatlands to absorb and store this carbon, but it gets released as soon as we mine it. We had a peat mine moratorium in Manitoba, but it has lapsed. SunGrow Horticulture has filed the first new peat mine proposal since 2011. Peat mining is exploiting our natural climate defense system for profit. We must say no. Visit wildernesscommedia.org and raise your voice to stop SunGrow's new evergreen peat mine. Public comment on this proposal ends December 5th, 2020. I'm Eric on the ground for the Wilderness Committee. Ontario's precious wetlands, woodlands, wildlife habitat and the conservation authorities that look after them are under threat by a government that seems hell-bent on cutting environmental protections and paving over paradise. I'm here at Duffins Creek Wetland Complex, one of the largest coastal wetlands on north shore of Lake Ontario. It straddles two urban areas of Ajax and Pickering and is on the traditional territory of Williams Treaty First Nations. Contact your MPP, no matter what their political stripe. Call them, email them, ask for a meeting, tell them what you think about the proposal to cut the power of conservation authorities to protect significant wetlands. You can sign up for our action alert to get the latest updates on these stories and more. Wow, tremendous news. BC Timber Sales has halted most logging activity in old growth mountain caribou habitat in Argonaut Creek. Locals and Indigenous nations had protested. Wilderness Committee supporters had written in. What wonderful news. here in the Caicos Valley in unceded Dididat territory on southwestern Vancouver Island. I'm in an old growth clear cut that's been logged over the last few months and this part of this watershed contains some of the last low elevation highly productive old growth rainforest capable of growing thousand year old trees that's left in the province of British Columbia. This kind of logging continues unabated despite government promising a new direction in, for BC's forest in September of 2020. The 350,000 hectares of logging that was deferred doesn't include this type of forest and road building is happening on either side of us here with new cut blocks planned for the next 6 to 12 months. This represents the urgency of this problem, and if Premier Horgan intends to keep the promises that he made during the election campaign, he has to do that in the next couple of months because he doesn't have three or four years. The government needs to step up, partner with the First Nations who these forests belong to, and immediately implement the 14 recommendations of the Old Growth Panel. To learn more and to get involved, please visit wildernesscommittee.org slash save old growth. environmental organization is asking for your help calling for change to old growth forest logging practices. The Wilderness Committee has started an initiative appropriately named Big Tree Tuesday. Every second Tuesday for the next two months, the nonprofit is spearheading a phone blitz that targets a different company or government agency involved in logging old growth forests. It says the goal is to give people the opportunity to send a message and to get the government to take action. The government hasn't done enough and that they don't have more time to waste. We don't have another three, four, five years to talk about this. Government needs to take action now and mobilizing people, uh, giving people a way to, to mobilize to help make that happen is what Big Tree Tuesday is all about. 
Today, the organization chose Teal Jones, which is involved in old growth logging on southern Vancouver Island, including Ferry Creek. The next Big Tree Tuesday will happen on February 9th. Ten thousand copies hot off the press of a brand new Wilderness Committee Education report. This time about fracking, the fracturing of the ground in order to get natural gas by the industry, causing damage to the land, water, and climate. This education report outlines the tremendous subsidies the oil and gas industry are getting for this, and lays out the course to get fracking stopped for good. Show. All right, welcome back to the show. Here we go with the great fracking debate in British Columbia. Hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking, very controversial. Of course, it's the method to extract natural gas from the ground. A big industry in British Columbia set to expand with the new LNG Canada plant coming online. Uh, but a new campaign underway now to ban fracking in the province. It's called Planet on Fire and Fracking in BC. It's a campaign by the Wilderness Committee. Let's discuss now. We got Peter McCartney on the line. He's a climate campaigner with the Wilderness Committee. I'm pleased to welcome him back to the show. Peter, thanks for doing us. Hey, Beth, thanks for having me. Tell me about this campaign. It's a campaign we've been working on for a while, but we're going hard at it this year because of new information that shows the oil and gas industry is the single largest polluter, more than more so than all other industry combined in British Columbia. And it's also the one that's increasing. Emissions have gone up 8% from that industry since 2007. These fracking companies are surviving off of massive public handouts from the provincial government. And we found that 14 out of 15 of the top fracking companies in BC ended up receiving more in fracking drilling credit than they actually paid in taxes and royalties. To see 14 tanks they want to add to this facility. Environmentalists and Indigenous opponents are keeping a close watch. Their fight against the pipeline expansion and uncertainty over the project led the federal government to buy Trans Mountain in 2018. They say it's not too late to cancel it. Trans Mountain wants to start construction in the Lower Mainland. That's going to be the place where people are extremely opposed. I do expect we'll start to see more on the ground resistance. And then more great news. The provincial and federal governments announced a halt to all logging in the Spuzzum Valley to protect the spotted owls that live there. They include another watershed. The hold is for one year, while a more fulsome plan for spotted owl protection is drawn up. Today, I am confirming that the Site C Clean Energy Project will be completed. That decision came through due diligence and care and deliberation on what was in the best interest of all British Columbians. And I believe today we've made the right decision. But critics of the dam, and there are many, point to unstable terrain on the Peace River shoreline as posing a huge safety risk. Like any gambler that's starting to lose, we don't want to leave the table. But if we don't leave the table, we could lose way bigger than we already have been. And they claim much of the project is still clouded in secrecy. You've got mail. My name is Eric Rader, and it is my honor to present the 2020 Eugene Rogers Award to the Hall of Water First Nation members of Camp Morningstar for their defense of the Hall of Water community and traditional territory from frac sand mining. 
Each year since 1992, the Wilderness Committee presents the Eugene Rogers Award in memory of BC conservationist Eugene Rogers, who worked tirelessly for the protection of wild spaces and wild salmon. The award goes to an individual or group who has worked exceptionally hard to protect nature. The award is in the form of a plaque and also accompanied by a $1,000 prize. The recipient's name is also placed with former recipients on a wood carving of spawning salmon by Salish artist William Watt that hangs in the Wilderness Committee office in Vancouver, BC. This year we are honoured to present it to Camp Morningstar because of their strong vision and perseverance. For the third Manitoba winter in a row, Camp Morningstar is holding space at the site of a proposed frac sand mine, working on cultural education for community members and visitors, and being guided by ceremony. Due to COVID-19, we are unable to present this award in person. However, the members of Camp Morningstar have recorded a short clip for you on the receipt of this award. On behalf of all of us at Camp Morningstar, we're so honoured to accept the Eugene Waters Environment Award. This is our third winter out here and it hasn't been an easy go. And so for us to be recognized this way, it really fills our, our spirits. Miigwech. Oh. Thank you. It's not a report card that your parents would be proud of. We've seen no indication that government takes that seriously, and, and, and that's why, that's why uh, we failed them on this report card. Six months after Premier Horgan promised to act on 14 recommendations from a report reviewing B.C. old-growth forestry practices, he's receiving failing grades from environmental groups. They're also concerned that the government hasn't presented any plan on how old-growth forests will be protected. They've taken no meaningful action to actually change what logging looks like on the ground. We can't assess uh, how, to, how to fix how we're managing old growth if we're constantly losing it. They want the forestry industry to be more sustainable by only logging second and third growth forests. The government says it's starting by engaging in discussions with Indigenous leaders and has deferred logging in nine key areas. 30,000 copies spot off the press of the Wilderness Committee's education report about spotted owl. It explains how this bird species has become the most endangered in Canada, all because of BC's out of control, unregulated logging of old growth forests. It explains how Spasm Nation stepped in to stop logging in their territory and lays out a plan working with Indigenous nations to protect this most endangered species. Habitat for endangered Blanding's turtles from a proposed massive rock quarry. I'm here on the beautiful north shore of Lake Huron, Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, to meet with local community members who have been trying to do just that. Hey, we're lucky we've got a beautiful sunny day. We're headed up to check out some Blanding's turtle critical habitat on the potential quarry site. We have some traditional ecological knowledge. Keeper elders from Serpent River First Nation with us. We've got our biologists and it's gonna be a great day. All right, we just got word that biologists have found a Blanding's turtle. So we're headed over there to check it out. Oh, My name the, is Free Love. The, oh the brother love is in there.
I'm Jane Williams. This is the Red Eye Podcast. In our show today, Lorraine Chisholm talks with Charlotte Daw about the federal and provincial government's failure to protect the southern mountain caribou. Charlotte Daw is conservation and policy campaigner for the Wilderness Committee. She is also the author of the report State of the Southern Mountain Caribou Habitat in BC, and she joins me now. Hello, Charlotte. Hi there. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really glad to talk to you today. Can you give us a picture of the current state of the southern mountain caribou population? Yes, it is bleak, unfortunately, to say the least. As of February 2020, this species has declined by 53% in six years. And we have six herds that that are now extirpated, meaning they no longer exist in BC. That herd has died off or the remaining few members cannot repopulate those herds anymore and they were likely taken and put into another herd. So that's where we're at right now. We used to have one herd that would wander into the United States, the South Selkirk herd, and that herd also went extinct. So the U.S. does not have southern mountain caribou as a species in their in their country anymore. Oh, that is bleak. What's the main reason for the decline? The ultimate cause of decline is habitat alteration and disturbance, which leads to a high predator rate on caribou. So essentially, as we disturb and disrupt the forest with things like logging roads, cup locks, oil and gas pipelines, and other what's called linear features through the forest, it allows wolves and predators to access caribou much easier and allows them to kill them much faster and easier as well. And so that predation rate is what's driving their decline, but the reason for it is habitat disturbance. Specifically, if you want to help caribou, we will send you actions on what you can do to help protect caribou. We recently had an amazing win in Argonaut Creek, and this is because of the public, because people like who's listening right now wrote letters to the BC government on a massive scale. I've never seen so much pushback to such an awful logging project that was proposed, and we got it canceled. So I would encourage people to follow Wilderness Committee right now, and we're actively giving updates on what they can do to help. Well, it's really been good talking with you this morning. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to learn about this issue and share this issue. It's so important. I've been speaking with Charlotte Daw. She is conservation and policy campaigner for the Wilderness Committee. 12,000 copies hot off the press of Wilderness Committee's education report, this time about southern mountain caribou and the fight to protect its forest habitat. The federal government has so far refused to stop the province of BC from permitting logging of critical habitat of this threatened species. Read what you can do to help in the fight to protect this beautiful creature from disappearing off the earth. To help local activists and give them the information they require, we produced an online interactive map showing industrial projects that move endangered species closer to extinction in the province of British Columbia. Good morning, I'm Suzanne, and today is Earth Day here on The Morning Buzz, and we are interviewing Charlotte Daw. She is the conservation and policy campaigner at the Wilderness Committee. Charlotte, thank you for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Of course. Can you give us some background information about the Wilderness Committee and what you do? Sure. So we've been around for quite a long time. We've been around in the 80s working on spotted owl stuff and in the Clackwatt Sound to protect the old growth forest there. And we're a grassroots organization organization, meaning we really work with communities to empower people within their communities to protect their wild spaces around them, and we work on combating the climate crisis. And one more thing I wanted to ask you too is, since obviously today is Earth Day, what is your message for today? I just want to send a message of hope to everyone. I know that these times are really challenging, and I, I want to send a message of hope specifically to the younger generation. I want everyone, no matter your age, to start speaking up and to start caring for the Earth and realizing that we don't get our actions We could be heading into a pretty disastrous place and crisis like the pandemic could be 
become an everyday type thing. So I just want everyone to start thinking about the earth in every action they do and every day they have. And it can seem like that would be really, that would be a burden, but it actually, it makes you feel quite good to know that you're doing something to benefit this beautiful planet that's given us so much. It's a very nice thing to say. Well, that's about it for this year's video. Remember, you can follow along our campaigns on our website. You can also follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and make sure you get on our action alert list to stay in touch. This has been Joe Foy for the Wilderness Committee. Bye for now.